Today's discussion, we're going to be dropping out of the specific narrative of events and dealing with sort of a broader worldwide kind of topic, and that is going to be industrialization. Uh, we're going to be talking about one of the major changes in human history from agriculture, mainly agricultural production, and this is one of the revolutions in human history too, the production of a non-edible uh, product. And so this is going to be one of the major changes. Uh, for this. And there are going to be a bunch of component changes and also uh, changes that are due to the Industrial Revolution that, that, that works together. We're going to be talking about changes in transportation, we're going to be talking about changes in work status, changes in urban patterns, changes in uh, political relations between peoples. And so there's going to be a lot of uh, big, big changes, which shouldn't surprise us, uh, as a result of industrialization because it's one of the major shifts in all of human history. So, all right, deal with this. And what is industrialization? How does it work? Right? Uh, the Industrial Revolution begins in Britain somewhere around 1787. We as historians have sort of picked 1787 when these various factors kind of come together and we say, okay, now we're dealing with industrialization, the Industrial Revolution. It's not like some you know, email went out at the end of 1786 and said, okay, everybody next year, Industrial Revolution, this is what we're doing. We as historians have kind of looked back and said, hey, industry's happening. You know, when exactly? And so 1787 is sort of when we've picked. That's not necessarily a date that you'll have to remember, but uh, what's going to happen is it's going to begin in Britain. Britain is definitely where it starts, but it's going to spread out to Western Europe first, and then to the United States, and then to the Americas, and then eastward into uh, Eastern Europe and Asia. And so uh, this transition, when we talk about just the initial shift in Britain, is going to have several causes. All right, one of these is going to be the agricultural revolution. We need to never lose sight of the fact that people have to eat, right? And so people are ever increasingly going to be engaged in some kind of industrial manufacture where they're not producing foodstuffs. Then you have to ask yourself, well, where's the foodstuff coming from, right? Well, what had happened with the agricultural revolution is uh, more and more food was being produced for less money. It, it's increased efficiency. Uh, you can think about it as calories per acre or you know, how, whatever you know, formula you want to do. But we're also going to see that it's requiring less and less human labor to do. So you've got more and more people who, uh, on the one hand, you say, well, they're losing their farm jobs. Yeah, but that means they're going to have to find work doing something else. And so these are going to be large numbers of people that are now available to become industrial workers in these industrial cities. And also, it's going to provide a market for manufactured products. So it's, it's sort of a two-for-all this one. One of the other things that you've got to have going for you in order to industrialize is capital, right? And this is the economic term capital. Britain at this point has the best credit and banking system in the world at that point. They had large reserves of liquid assets in private hands. What that meant was if somebody said, hey, I want to invest in a factory. I want to build one. I want to hire workers. You need money. You need money to be able to do that. More importantly, you need it in private hands so that, that way they can say, hey, we're going to build this. If it makes profit, I'm going to make money because when the government gets involved, well, those of you who don't pay attention to what the government does, it generally uh, isn't very effective at far, as far as uh, making money goes, right? So what about the government, right? Unlike the absolutists that you would find on the continent of Europe, Britain had, for the most part, missed out on this. And they had a relatively lax government over the top of them, especially in terms of the governmental controls over the economy. Right? What this did was this encouraged entrepreneurship. People felt like they could start their own business that could then, in return, make them a lot of money. And they weren't going to have to uh, have the government leaning all over them. Right? Four, we have to get into a little bit of technical aspects, and that's these specific resources. Now, when you're talking about industrialization, especially in the late 1700s and the early 1800s, there are a few resources that you're going to have to have on hand. And the two most important industrial resources initially are deposits of coal and iron ore. Britain could find both of those within its borders. Uh, we're not quite up to the point where uh, we're going to need you know, sort of massive reserves uh, of oil, but uh, coal and iron ore are going to be plentiful enough, and especially the coal that you can find in Britain is the really good sort of dark, you know, kind of hot burning coal uh, that's going to be pretty efficient with this, right? And then last, who are you going to sell this stuff to? Right? How are you going to get rid of this? You, know, you crank out you know, thousands of you know, industrially made you know, horse brushes or whatever. Uh, <clears throat> you got to be able to sell them somewhere. Well, Britain's overseas empire and trade partners around the world allowed British industries massive outlets for their industrial products. So they were at a place where they could sell all this kind of stuff, right? We're also going to see that this is going to be the uh, age of some specific technological changes, right? 
And the place that we're going to look at initially is the, the place that we're most evidence of industrial change in Britain history, uh, and that's going to be in the textiles uh, industry. Now, textiles is, is, is sort of just a fancy way to say a clothing manufacturer, production of you know thread and then cloth and then clothing. So you know, that's that's what we're going to be dealing with here, right? Now, <clears throat> we're also going to see that one of the nice little side sh uh, side shots uh, of this is industrialization minimally uh, at this point in the United States had allowed for the inexpensive production of cotton, right? Uh, the cotton gin uh, in the United States had radically altered you know, the relationship of the United States and then eventually the world to cotton. And of course, this is going to affect Britain because Britain had a massive textile industry and they began importing cotton in huge numbers from the American South. And of course, this fiber would go on to replace wool. Wool had long been the fabric of choice uh, for clothiers in Britain until finally it was replaced with cotton because cotton is flipping awesome, right? It's cool, it's light, it's dry. Right? It's just this wonderfully soft stuff, right? So <clears throat> once in England, raw cotton is turned into garments using an ever-increasing series of improving bits of technology. You've got the water frame, power loom, spinning jenny. All of these are industrial products, big pieces of machinery. Um, now, <clears throat> when you move to this type of manufacture, these inventions necessitate some changes in terms of the way that you work. You couldn't do this the way that they had done this before with uh, cottage industry because you had to have a large factory. You had to have a place. You had to bring the workers to the machine, if you will. Then try to take the machine apart and bring it to the workers. It just really wasn't the way you did things. A lot of people, at this point, they worked out of their home. The home was where they worked, whether it was a farm, whether it was cottage industry, whether it was a hybrid of both. Uh, at this point now, what you're seeing here is changes in the way people work. They go, they leave home, they go to a place, they work for a while, and then they come back. This is something that we're really used to um, in our world. Uh, today, but was a pretty radical change for these people in the late 17 and the early 1800s. Now, we're also going to see that location was important because for the most part these factories are situated near rivers in order for them to uh, use the flowing water as power for the machines at this point. So this is what you'd see in a lot of these factories. You guys are there, these ladies are sitting at these rows and rows of benches and they're making brushes. And if you ever wonder why, oh I got rows and organization, you've got that uh, going on because they've got to be strapped to some kind of power supply. In this case, uh, the machine that they're using to do this work uh, is strapped to a single shaft axle and the pulley system is what's uh, allowing power to go to the machines. This is a, an American version. This is a New England factory town where you can see the row houses and then of course you've got the spillway over which you're going to power the shaft that's going to provide power to the workhouses that you can see on the left of the frame. Right? One of the other major shifts that's going to take place in human history is going to be harnessing the power of steam. Right? In 1782, a Scottish guy named James Watt, right? You, when you pay your power bill, you pay them off in James Watts, right? Or probably James Cuba Watts, but still, right? Uh, he invented an efficient engine that ran on steam power. He's not necessarily the first guy that, that invents the steam engine. A lot of people had been experimenting with the idea of forcing steam through turbine tubes, and then you turn a turbine anyway. Uh, Watt was the guy, though, that gets the credit for inventing the one that really worked well, all right? Uh, now, the way that you get the steam is you've got a giant boiler, you've got water in there, and then you heat the water up by burning coal in this case, and then you force the steam through these tubes. Um, now, once you get the turbine turning, though, you can attach whatever you want to this turning shaft, and then you can run machinery. So this is, this is how it works, right? Now, the reason that this is really important is because these are much more, these steam engines are much more uh, efficient, they're much more powerful, and they're much more long-lasting than horsepower. A lot of these early factories, you'd find horses or donkeys or mules or something like that attached to some kind of turnstile, right? And they're working this capstan-type device, and they just sort of walk around in a circle. Um, but you've got to stop horses for a while, and you've got to feed them, and you got to, you know, they can only provide, you know, a horse can only provide one horsepower, right? Whereas the steam engine is much more reliable, much more efficient uh, than this. What that meant, though, was as more and more of these places are converting over to steam power, they're also burning a lot of coal smoke, right? These industrial cities were spewing huge pillars of coal smoke every single day uh, as these factories employed this coal-fired uh, steam power. You can see this evidenced in a lot of places. If you, um, read a lot of Dickens, you know, set in the 1800s in England and stuff like that, especially in London, they talk about just how hazy and nasty it is. Um, and you can see this uh, in movies when they take Dickens' work and they turn them into movies, you know, the coal smoke is kind of everywhere. So a major ecological impact uh, as a result of this as well. Now, 
Eventually this idea of the steam engine is going to be used on ships. Instead of a stable steam engine used for a factory, how about a portable one that you can put in a ship? And instead of relying on wind power, uh, you're going to rely on the turning of the crank for propellers. And what that is going to do is going to revolutionize transportation uh, in so many ways because uh, waterborne transportation had been completely reliant on the movement of water and the movement of wind. Now, maybe not so much, right? So you take this and you couple it with the improvements in the smelting of iron ore and you're going to have some major changes as well. Coal is going to be used ever increasingly to change the way that uh, ore is transformed into uh, steel and instead of just simply boiling this stuff, right, and sort of scraping this off, coal is going to ever increasingly be used to heat and blast the impurities from this iron and is going to strengthen it a, a great deal. What that meant is now you can have the introduction of cast iron pieces of machinery and the idea of interchangeable parts. This is something that we're used to. Part of your car goes out, you go down to the auto parts store, you say, this is the kind of car I have, you know, my alternator went out, and then you give you another one. You say, well, wait a minute, it wasn't made by the same company. It wasn't made at the same time. It doesn't matter. They're all interchangeable, at least they're supposed to be, right? Uh, and so what that meant, though, is it's much more efficient. It's a lot less expensive. And so these are going to be some changes that are going to take place as well. Uh, this is Staffordshire. This is an early English industrial town. You can see how hazy and smoky and coaly word, right, that this is. Uh, and so this is one of the uh, sort of uh, archetypes uh, of 19th century England and a lot of places that are going to industrialize because you've got a lot of this coal smoke and it's pretty thick and it's kind of gunky and it's probably not the healthiest uh, for you to breathe, right? So these, these guys are working on one of these blast furnaces and they're uh, strengthening up this uh, iron by using the coal smoke, uh, coal blast furnaces to uh, improve the impurities. This is the train yard here. Uh, it's kind of depressing, right? sort of sad because of all the coal smoke, right? Now. We're also going to see when we take this steam power and this industrialization that's going to create and also use massive changes in transportation in terms of both the way the people and their products get around. One of the things that's going to be the major change is the introduction of canalization. Now, the, the, the idea of a canal is not new. It was not new at this point. You know, the, the ancient you know, Babylonians had canals. You know, the Persian Empire had canals. The Romans had canals. But massive canalization, which is a systematic program here in uh, Europe at this point, is going to be connecting all these parts first in England and then especially in northern and parts of southern Europe uh, by water transportation. And what that meant was you're going you're to dig one of these canals, you're going to fill it up with water, and something that would be normally a landlocked area that doesn't have direct access to the ocean either because they don't have a seaport or they don't have a navigable river right next to it, now all of a sudden you do. You've got a man-made navigable river. And so this allows for fast transit of heavy materials. Think of them as water highways. Because at this point, when you've got large amounts of heavy goods, whether it's an agricultural product, whether it's 100 tons of iron girders, it doesn't matter. Certain things just can't be carried on horse bikes. I mean, that's just, it's, it's not feasible, all right? But the buoyancy of water means that you can move this kind of stuff if you have a barge large enough. And you just need to provide enough horsepower to kind of move it along the surface of the water. And this is exactly what these guys are going to be doing. This is going to be more popular here um, in Europe than it is going to be in North and South America. Another one of these changes uh, that's going to be harnessing steam power uh, is going to be the railroads. Now, at this point, especially early 1800s, is the railroads are in their infancy. The first railroad doesn't begin operating. I think the first trial is like 1828 in America. But the reason that you like this is this speeds up overland travel. It's much cheaper to construct a railroad line than it is a canal. Uh, you can move heavy loads and you can go over land. Uh, this is going to be one of the major changes that's going to influence, especially the United States, because you've got much broader distances. It's easier to build canals uh, in Europe where the population density is a lot higher. People are living closer to one another. They'll, they're going to have their railroads as well. Um, but the United States is going to have to rely, and also uh, places in South America, are going to have to rely more heavily on the railroad than they are on canals. Steamship, though, is going to transform worldwide transportation because, as I mentioned previously, steamships now can move at their own speed, they're under their own power, regardless of whatever the wind and tide is doing. This is also going to speed up canal traffic eventually once they uh, introduce this. And so, this is one of these canals. Uh, you see the water here off to the right, and they got these canal boats. You got this one horse pulling this giant load. And this is a good idea of what the appeal of the canal is that you've got water transportation in an inland area that only requires a minimal amount of uh, labor to get it going. 
This is Bridgewater, Massachusetts, to give you an idea of what railroads look like here, uh, circa 1860 uh, or so. This is one of these steam and sail ships as the, the transition between pure sailing vessels and pure steamships is taking place. In many cases, what uh, companies would do is they would put steam power in an already existing sailing ship so that if they were going along and the wind was going to help them out, they'd set the sails and they would use the power of the wind and of the water. But if they wanted to sail, say, up a river where the water's only going to hinder them, they would just engage the steam engine and they would go in that way. I threw this one in because it's pretty freaky, right? You've got a ship and it's going out of the river mouth and it's heading out to sea. Okay, cool, right? Fine, no problem there. And then you've got a ship going on a bridge over the top of it. This is one of these canals. And of course, they built a bridge over this river because if they tried to connect the canal, all the canal water would run down into the river and you wouldn't be able to use it. So they just simply built a bridge and you have this ship sailing over the top of another ship. Freaky, right? When we get down onto the, the local sort of personal social changes as a result of that, as I mentioned, people are shifting the way that their work patterns are. They're leaving home and they're going to work at a factory and they're working for sort of set periods of time and they're getting paid for set periods of time. So that's, that's a pretty radical shift. You're not your own boss anymore, right? Uh, so the, when you had jobs outside of the home, and a lot of people, you know, uh, at various points here in world history did in Europe and North and South America, right? Uh, you worked for the most part in small businesses and you knew who your boss was and your boss knew who you were. You know, you've got a crew only kind of limited size. And Instead now, as factories are getting bigger and bigger, it becomes impossible to have those personal connections. You, just, you just can't, you know, when you've got a thousand workers, it's unreasonable to say, well, you know, the boss doesn't know me, he doesn't care about me. Yeah, he doesn't know you because there's like a thousand of you. It's, you know, it's not reasonable to expect the boss to understand this. But that has an important social impact, right? Workers are paid by a very impersonal boss. He's a figurehead. He's the guy that sits in the office and does that kind of stuff. And so uh, that's what's going on there, right? The schedule is run by a machine, by a clock. The idea is that you're no longer being paid for how good of a product that you crank out because the machine makes everything about the same anyway. So you're being paid for how long you work the machine. The longer you work the machine, you can do the math and figure out about how much product you've been able to crank out. And so you get paid essentially either by the hour or by the day or whatever, right? This is something again that you and I are sort of used to, that you get paid a certain amount you know, by the hour. Uh, but that was a pretty radical shift in this. That it wasn't, you're not being paid for your excellence of your labor, you're just being paid for a certain amount of your labor, right? So, this lack of individual achievement, it shouldn't surprise us, it, along with their changing relationship with their boss, it serves to really dehumanize these workers. They're just sort of one of the cogs in the machine themselves. Now, it doesn't help the fact that work norms were a lot different than, than you and I would be comfortable with now. The management was a lot tougher on their workers. They used a lot more tough punishments, uh, sometimes uh, physical punishments, where they bop people in the back of the head uh, to keep them working, uh, to keep them at their tasks. Uh, it, was, it was rough kind of uh, business of this. We're also going to see that women in child labor was really, really common uh, at this point. But generally speaking, they were paid a lot less just because they're women and they're children, and so they can't be expected to do as much. Despite the fact, in some cases, children could do certain types of specialized labor because their small hands or small bodies could fit into some places with this as well. So this is our male boss manager, and he is checking behind the work of this lady factory worker, and I don't know if he's going to smack her or not, but this gives you an idea of kind of how the relationship of management to worker was going at this point. Here's some child labor. Here's a couple little girls that are carrying sacks of coal up this slope, and uh, unfortunately, little Sally's lost the control of hers, and it looks like Susie's about to catch some on top of her little pumpkin head. So, <clears throat> on the one hand, you know, we paint a kind of bleak picture of industry, the coal smoke and dehumanization, and oh my goodness, this is horrible, except one undeniable fact was taking place, and that is the standard of living of people that were in Britain surged, and soon outstripped and led the world, right? Now, you can't, you can't do that and have other people not notice. You can't all of a sudden start paying the houses are getting bigger, more and more people are affording stuff, their clothing's improving, their diet's improving. Uh, yeah, they're living in these cities and it's kind of rough, but their standard of living is going up, way up, and they're way ahead of everybody else, right? Now, <clears throat> other people are going to notice this and they're going to want to get in on it. As soon as you see somebody have a great deal of success, you say, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm going to do some of that too, right? Now, one of the initial impediments 
to the spread of industry was the series of Napoleonic Wars, the French Revolutionary Wars and Napoleonic Wars. And so you had a number of problems and when these guys are fighting each other, the sharing of cultural and you know economic ideas and you know uh, economic product things like that you know that's going to be impeded right now once that's going to come to a final conclusion in 1815 industrialization is going to spread much more quickly on first the continent of Europe now not every nation is going to have the same advantages or even the inclination to industrialize in the same way that Britain did right one of the things that of course Britain having such a huge head start over the other countries. Uh, of the world is that Britain was able to crank out a large amount of product that was relatively inexpensive, and of course, because of these series of wars, they kind of had to sit on a lot of this stuff. And if you know anything about uh, retail, when you have a lot of stuff and you're trying to sell it and you can't get rid of it, you put it on sale. And that's exactly what had happened here. So continental powers uh, and the United States uh, around the world are looking at this flood of very cheap and seemingly unending uh, supply of uh, British manufactured goods, and they, are, they come to the all pretty much the same conclusion, and that is, hey, if we just keep buying all this stuff, all our own domestic manufacturers are going to go out of business. Because everybody's going to go buy British goods because they're so much cheaper than everything else. And then all of our people are going to be out of work, and we can't have that. So what they're going to do is they're going to rely on tariffs. A tariff is a tax on something coming into your country from someplace else. And the idea behind this, this was not new, at least not for the United States, this was not new, you tax things coming in to make money. This is this point, though, is you're going to slap a really, really high tariff on it to artificially increase the cost. So this is a policy choice by the United States, by France, by Belgium, by Spain, by some of these other countries, to artificially increase the price. This is going to set them politically uh, on edge against Britain. Now, what is going to happen, though, is industrialization would take off. Right? Generally speaking, we're going to see Western Europe is going to industrialize in the first half of the 1800s. Central Europe is going to be in the last half. Eastern Europe is going to wait until the 1890s, early 1900s, if at all. There are some places that industrialization is going to kind of, not necessarily totally skip over, but really aren't going to get very well implanted uh, in as well. Now, American industrialization uh, is going to begin soon at, uh, to surpass Britain. This is the United States here. Uh, by the late 1800s, but was slowed down by one factor, and that's this huge land area that the United States has to learn to bridge in, uh, by its transportation infrastructure in order to get everybody connected and all these factories uh, producing. Now, once it would do this, especially in the uh, post-American Civil War period, industrialization is going to shoot uh, off the charts. We're also going to see massive industrialization in South America, Central and South America, Central less, uh, in South America here in the late 1800s uh, as well. This is the Crystal Palace. It's constructed in England for one of these world's fairs, and it's steel and glass, and it is ridiculously impressive, and essentially is a throwaway structure. You come, you visit, you have your little conventions, people go, wow, and then they eventually go home. And anybody that can construct this for just a, hey, look at, look at how cool we are, really is going to impress the pants off of everybody that shows up. And that is what this, is, this uh, world's fair that they have here in England is going to convince a lot of people, hey, I think industrialization is way to go. Uh, and that's exactly what they're going to do here. And as industrialization began to take off, you can see some of these industrial um, treatises, and this one is in French. Uh, this is, of course, what the Germans do when they get a hold of the industrialization, and that's they build giant cannons. You know, Germans, they go with what they're good at, right? This is American industrialization, where you get steamships and steam trains, right? You've got the uh, cotton gin, as I mentioned before, uh, with this. One of the other social changes that's going to take place during this period is a massive population explosion especially here in uh, Western Europe, right? Europe's population in 1740 was about, uh, 1750 was about 140 million people, right? It's a lot, that'd be a lot to try to pack in this room, but when you compare it to only 100 years later, it had swollen to 266 million. This was a, a massive population explosion, all right? Now the reason for this was the improved food distribution systems that had taken place that had made food more readily available and was much more affordable so your area is in a famine, oh, not necessarily do we all have to die. We just bring in food uh, from someplace else. And then, of course, the reverse is true. Those people, they have some kind of flood and it floods their fields. Well, that's okay. We can bring in food from the places that still have it. Uh, and that's going to improve people's survivability rates. We're also going to see a general decline in massive outbreaks of disease and warfare. So the things that are killing us we're going away, right? Now, there were a couple of exceptions to this, right? You have Ireland uh, has a potato famine, and in southern Germany, you have a series of other uh, agricultural failures. 
uh, and you do have large out migrations uh, as a result of that. So it's not necessarily massive death, although you're going to have some. Uh, we are going to see that uh, this is going to cause some changes. All right. So now, as the factory system grew, right, farm labor is going to wane because farms are becoming more and more efficient, and people are then moving uh, into these industrial cities in order to find industrial work. Right? This is going to create also an urban explosion. Now, whenever you have rapid urbanization, you have problems. You have problems. How do you fit large numbers of people in a relatively small space over a relatively short period of time? Nobody that I know of anywhere throughout human history has really come up with an effective answer to that question. The Romans had problems with this. Uh, you know, the uh, Europeans are going to have problems with this. Americans are going to have problems with it. Everybody has problems with this. And so you've got uh, this rapid flow of immigrants, and these cities can't cope. You have the workers that are living in relatively poor conditions because they can only find uh, you know, certain places that their salaries uh, can rent them. You've got row houses that are often cramped together, and these people are packed on top of each other, and that creates, of course, sanitation problems and disease problems, and you've also got problems with how to get enough clean water to these people. And so cities were essentially some pretty bad death traps. Not, not to say that you just sort of walked into one and you dropped dead immediately, but you do have these scenes where people are forced to sleep in cellars uh, and make whatever limited accommodations that they can. Uh, in some cases, people who are thrown into debtor's prison are... Uh, forced to walk the treadmill to uh, provide power to local industry. You got a lot of people that are just kind of hanging out on the streets because the insides are so fetid and squalid conditions that it's actually better to be outside on a cold day than it is to be inside uh, with this. Here's a political cartoon of Death's Dispensary, right? They're at the local um, pump and they're getting the water, and you can see that it's actually the Grim Reaper is dispensing this stuff out because much of the groundwater was, of course, contaminated and did not. Uh, have enough uh, filtration systems and things like that because you know, most of that didn't exist yet. And of course it costs money to put this into place and this was just really, really rough on a lot of these people. This is a, a little bit of art that's going to come from later in the 1800s, this is Impressionism and things like that. But I really like this one because it gives you an idea of just really the shift in people and their culture and their relationship to one another because they're in these cities, there are these masses of people, there's a gray cloudy sky, nobody is an individual anymore, we're all just sort of part of the blobs. And it really has an, uh, an important psychological effect uh, on these people. Now, when we also talk about social organization, this is going to undergo some pretty sharp breaks as well. Now, industrialization is going to produce two classes of people that are really, really evident by 1850. The middle class, the bourgeoisie, if you'll allow the technical term, while you also got a working class, the proletariat. Had there been upper, middle, and lower classes before in human history? Yes. But an industrial bourgeoisie and an industrial working class had not existed before. So these are very specific classes that are going to get, uh, arise due to the changes of industrialization. Now, who are these middle class people? These middle class people are the entrepreneurs and also the white collar workers that are forming the management basis uh, for these businesses. These are the guys that are going to be starting factories and cities uh, and are providing the, you know, the, the legal department, the accounting, the engineering uh, for these mills. Uh, as they go forward. So these are the guys that are making a little bit higher salary. Uh, these the entrepreneurs, if they're able to make some money, they're able to make some pretty good money in some cases. Right? Now, industrialization produces more, more wealth. What's interesting is many of these people in the middle actually began to outstrip the wealthy in terms of money. The old definition, the old order of wealth was land. Land control and being born to the right family. And yeah, you had money, but then all of a sudden some of these guys who weren't born to these right families have like a lot more money than you do. Right? So you're going to have some significant conflict here between the land and agrarian aristocracy uh, and some of these nouveau riche uh, bourgeoisie middle class entrepreneurs. Now, although some aristocrats are going to start factories and they're going to engage in this, for the most part, they're going to hold to the old order, which was land and power and you know, family connections meant authority in society, whereas the middle class, ever, you know, they, they, they can't have access to that. If they weren't born into the right family, they weren't born into the right family. If you're not going to be you know, uh, Lord Toddington or whatever, uh, because when your dad dies, then you're just never going to inherit that land. So the best you can do is just make tons of money. You can have a fancy suit, you can have a fancy house, you can have a fancy carriage, right? Uh, and that's the best you're going to be able to do. And we're going to see that in terms of cash wealth, many of these guys begin to outstrip the old guys, right? Now, most of these people are going to come from humble backgrounds, and their culture reflects 
that of people who have newly come into money. What you will see, though, and unsurprisingly, this is what happens in pretty much every civilization everywhere, is the middle class begin to act like the upper class, and then once intermarriage begins to take place, uh, this is what's going to take, uh, what's going to happen here. So we got on the left here, we get this industrial bourgeoisie, and then you got the old order wealthy. And you can see these guys are trying pretty hard to look like this guy. They haven't quite got it down yet with the vest and the waistcoat and the hat and the cane and stuff like that. But these guys, you know, they got the they got the little swept back coat and they got the top hat, and so they've got some stuff going on. And you can see that uh, this is how these guys uh, began to uh, clad themselves. Right? What about the proletariat? When we talk about the overall numbers, this is going to be the bulk of society. Now, the 1800s is going to oversee this transformation of urban workers from being skilled artisans which commanded a pretty good income to being unskilled industrial laborers. This was a pretty raw shock for a lot of people who were used to being stonemasons or glass workers or shoemakers or something like that. They were paid a pretty good wage to go in and do this kind of work because it depended on your hand labor, but all of a sudden you're just a cog in the machine. You work the machine, the machine makes the stuff, you get paid by the hour. That's rough. Okay. Many more, especially women, when we're talking about here in Britain, they work as domestic servants for the wealthy or the upper middle class. So uh, you can get actually a decent window into this if you watch the old Disney film, Mary Poppins. Right? Now, this class, the proletariat, the way that they feel what their relationship is is they are being predated upon by the upper classes in order to produce a cheap product in rather horrible working conditions. Right? Now, the hours were pretty long, uh, long by our standards, 12 to 14 hour days. The factories themselves were hot, in many cases unventilated, and for the most part, by our standards today, really, really unsafe. Right? Child labor becomes systematic because a lot of people need their kids to work in order to be able to make enough money to make ends meet. Um, and factories were very interested in hiring children because in some cases they could do jobs that the adults couldn't do. You can crawl into, under the machinery without having to shut it off, but careful, Timmy, you know, there are a lot of whirling blades under there, right? Uh, or down there a mine shaft. This doesn't sound like the safest thing to you. That's because it's not, right? Now, people were often harmed for life because the machinery was not as safe as it is now. I mean, any industrial activity always is fraught with a certain amount of personal danger, right? But you went in and you had some kind of accident, you get your arm sawed off, and you know, the company, well, you should have been more careful. Well, you're fired. Well, what are you fired for? We only got one arm. We need two armed people. And so you're then thrown onto whatever the local welfare system is, for the most part, the church, for survival because you can no longer get a job or you only have sub substandard job prospects. So it's a pretty harsh world and a pretty uh, abrupt transition for a lot of these uh, workers, right? Now, the standard of living for the first generation industrial workers was pretty low. Let's, let's not mince uh, words about this. And the prospect for improvement looked about as low, right? You have all of the concomitant problems of early industrialization. We're going to start something we know is going to make a lot of money, and then, oh, man, another factory opening has better stuff, so now we're out of business. You have economic downturns. You have inflation because of the sudden increases of wealth. You have overlording bosses. You have unsafe working conditions. And what's going to happen is a lot of these people are really, really frustrated. You get large groups of frustrated people, and they're going to seek an outlet for that emotion, and they want to have action to redress their grievances. And what they're going to do is they are going to band together to try to strike back at what they see as a power structure. All right? Now, the English Parliament, if we go back to our British example, had officially banned labor unions in 1800. No, workers can't get together. But the workers, they form these unions anyway. Although they're pretty limited in terms of their goals based on modern sort of labor union standards. Generally speaking, they wanted to emulate what had been the old guild practices of the kind of medieval era. And that was they wanted help keeping people out of the labor market so that way they could control the wages. This had been the old guild system. You didn't get in if you weren't good enough. And what that meant is if there weren't 10,000 shoemakers walking around town, then you didn't have as so much job competition for your shoes. The same thing is going to be true here. If you didn't have everybody in town that was able to get a job in the factory, uh, then you would thus be able to control wages a little bit more. right? So this isn't going to be totally successful. Uh, they eventually would go towards the more modern practice, which is trying to reach collective agreements with the owners of the mills. And so this is something that basically the main purpose of labor unions are. Now, now, of course, the owners, they don't care for unions. Anybody that's going to come and, and say, you know, you guys can't do what you, exactly what you want to do, that's not going to go over well with anybody. Okay? Well, the only weapon left for these unions is, uh, hey, you guys won't give us the money that we want. You won't you know, deal with working conditions or hours or whatever they're worked up about. And that is to strike back, literally, 
uh, by quitting working. Okay? If nobody comes in and nobody works the factory, if we're on strike, then you don't have any product and you're going to lose money and then you're going to have to meet us at the bargaining table. There are some pretty bitter strikes that take place, 1810, 1813, and 1818. All right? Now, one of the Long-time goals of labor unions is to form these international groups where we all the workers of the world, you know, Marx, when we get to Marx, you know, we'll talk about that. That's one of them, all the workers of the world, they have stuff in common, okay? Uh, but these guys are really much more comfortable local trade unions in their towns rather than even, at this point in history, national industrial organizations. Eventually we'll see some national ones form. There really never has been successful international labor organizations uh, at this point, right? Well, Parliament begins to take the workers a little more seriously. All right? What's ironic is some of the old order money gets back into power, the Tories, and they begin to lean all over the Whigs, this new money group, and say, listen, you guys can't ruin the cities. You can't treat the workers like this. Uh, and some reform legislation is going to come down to try to uh, help the plight of these uh, workers and help alleviate some of the, the, the urban blight that was hitting Britain's cities at this point. Now, other countries aren't going to respond with quite as much vigor, so what's interesting is by the time we get to mid-century, we're going to see a number of revolutions that are at least going to be partly industrial labor related, or partly socialist related. Britain is not going to be overwhelmed by this because at least in part they were willing to compromise uh, on a lot of these issues. And so here you can see the Tories are coming in and they're wrangling these uh, various Whig factions and they're going to say, hey, you guys, you guys got to pay a little bit more of attention to uh, the plight of these workers. All right? Well. <clears throat> Eventually, we will get into our discussion of socialism, but in order to do that, we've got to back up a little bit and talk about where the modern incarnation of socialism is going to come from, at least on a theoretical basis. And that's going to be here with Uncle Karl, Karl Marx. Right? We're going to see a series of revolutions that are going to hit uh, Europe in 1848 and are going to reverberate really around the world. And in the shadow of these, you're going to have two German uh, journalists, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, and they're going to flee to Britain. Okay? Their ideas of revolutionary socialism are going to be the ones that are going to eventually affect the entire world, whether it's the Soviet Union, whether it's the People's Republic of China, whether it's uh, Venezuela. The idea of Marxist socialism is going to be the, the, the type that eventually is going to become the pervasive one. All right? In 1848, we're going to see the publication of the Communist Manifesto, all right? which lays out the basic tenets of Marxist thought. All right? Now. When the Communist Manifesto comes out, it's not like socialists around the world, oh, here it is, this is, this is our new Bible, okay? It kind of sits around for a few decades before more and more socialist groups start picking this up and going, no, this is really the direction we want to go. But we do have to understand what's in it, even though it wasn't necessarily immediately a smash, okay? So first major tenet is that workers were a class, class, okay? So when you start hearing me use this through the rest of the semester, I'm speaking in very specific, you know, kind of Marxist terms, right? This class, of course, was the proletariat. Well, okay, fine, you're in a group. Cool. Well, that implies that there are other people that are in different groups, right? The other group, the other major group, is the bourgeois, right? And uh, what's the relationship between these two groups? Are they complementary? Do they ignore each other? No. Marx argues that they're engaged in a social war with one another. So you got group A and group B, and their relationship to one another is they fight. They fight for power and for social dominance. Two, liberalism and nationalism were anathema to socialism. Okay? That you can't be a liberal and you can't be a nationalist. And we will see that eventually, by the time you get to the 20th century, a lot of people are going to say, hey, why can't we put nationalism with socialism? Of course, you know, that would be guys like Hitler. Right? So, but this is Marx. All right? Three, what are the workers, what should they do about this? Workers uh, should rise in revolution around the world and institute a socialist state. Workers of the world unite is the quote. You have nothing to lose uh, but your chance. So this is revolutionary socialism, right? You don't peacefully seek this through elections. You don't campaign. You don't run ads in the media and things like that and say, hey, we should be all more socialist. No, because this is a power relationship, because this is essentially a social war, we need to fight back. We need to go and we need to demand whatever is supposed to happen. Okay? Now, to this end, Marx is going to try to organize international workers' groups, but these, these groups fail. Right? The, the world really has never been you know, ready for international workers' group. Right? So what that meant was socialist successes would be confined to nationalist forms of socialism rather than international forms of socialism. You will see by the time you get to the 20th century, the Soviet Union tries to export a lot of socialism, you know, communistic socialism around the world. There's going to be a limited amount of success, but then you know, in 1991, the Soviet Union collapses. 
uh, with this. So this is Uncle Carl, right? There he is. There he is, a little bit younger. There's Friedrich Engels uh, with him uh, in this, right? Uh, this is the Manifesto of the Communist Party. He also wrote Das Kapital. He wrote a number of other works. So this is industrialization. This is the changes that uh, it uh, brings in from top to bottom. It's sort of a very broad view. And then when we get back together next time, we'll talk about, okay, what ideas uh, are going to be fusing together and causing some other major changes in uh, world history.